FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 12, 11, 17. Well, Kerry, markets, they just keep going up. Bitcoin keeps going up. The place where there's real value, not so much. Is that about to change? Oh, before we talk, don't forget, send us an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. Be part of the show. We'd love to hear your opinion. And don't forget the Twitter feeds at Kerry Lutz. So, is it all about to change? Is there a report that has basically been a great indicator of this? Well, John Rubino is with us now. John, happy Monday. Hey, Gary. Um, yeah, yeah. this does feel like the blow-off phase of a bubble. Um, just like 1999 and 2006, 2007, with everything gapping up and people starting to believe that it'll happen this way forever and retail investors piling into stocks, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and Bitcoin um, going parabolic. All of this stuff has the feel of previous blow-off tops and bubbles. Well, we'll see if it repeats. But, um, you know, there there are numbers out there that imply that, um, that we, you know, we are repeating the experience of those, uh, th- those previous bubbles. Um, one good source for that kind of data is Doug Noland at the Credit Bubble Bulletin. Every quarter, he does an analysis of the Fed's Z1 report, which is basically the Fed um, giving out information on everything that's going on in the economy. And you can draw a lot of uh, historical comparisons from that because they've got the, um, the data going way back. And and uh, Nolan pulls out a few that I turned into charts and posted on dollar collapse that are that are really striking. Um, so I'll, I'll just go through them really quickly. Uh, the first is the uh, the rest of the world holdings of U.S. financial assets. In other words, how much of our stocks and bonds are in the hands of foreigners now? Um, the, the reason for that, that that's that important. If the if other countries like China and Saudi Arabia and Russia own a lot of our stocks and bonds, um, they have the ability to control prices to an extent in our markets. You know, if they want to sell our treasury bonds, they can really change the nature of U.S. interest rates. They can spike interest rates here and cause a financial crisis if they want to, or if they just lose faith in us. You know, it doesn't even have to be a ge- geopolitical thing. It, ju- it can just be a, an investment decision on the, on the part of a few big players in the rest of the world that, uh, that really come back to haunt us. Uh, and in 1999, at the peak of the, the tech stock bubble, uh, foreigners held about $5 trillion of U.S. assets. In 2007, it had gotten up to $15 trillion, and now it's like $26 trillion. In other words, um, assets held by foreigners is a bigger number than the U.S. economy. And that's, you know, potentially very scary. Um, the, the second stat is U.S. equities as a percent of GDP. In other words, how high is the stock market in relation to the size of the economy? Uh, in 1999, it was 200 percent. In 2007, it was 180 uh, percent. Now it's 221 or 22 percent. In other words, the, the stock market now is valued in relation to the economy at a higher level than it was during the tech stock bubble. And the tech stock bubble is sort of the uh, the template for stock over overvaluation. You know, that's that's where you look when you want to see as high as stocks have ever gone. Um, and now, at least by this measure, not quite by P.E. ratios yet, but by this measure, stocks are more richly valued than they were in 1999. Um the, the final stat is total U.S. securities, which is debt and equities. In other words, treasury bonds, corporate bonds, et cetera, et cetera, plus stocks. Um, and that's been going up steadily. It was 350 percent of GDP in 1999, 370 or so percent of GDP in 2007. Now it's almost 450 percent of GDP. Wow. So by those measures of asset valuation, we are more fragile, more ready for a crash than we've ever been in our history. So if history is any kind of a guide, in other words, if if things aren't different this time in some fundamental way, then we're headed for something pretty serious, you know, something like 2008, 2009, or something like the, the bursting of the tech stock bubble. And in fairly short order. So 2018, you know, now that interest rates are going up, um, could be a, a really interesting, scary year because we've got insanely 
positive valuation numbers hitting a, a negative change in interest rates. Um, and it's happening fairly quickly because the economy is putting up some pretty good numbers that is leading the Fed and some other central banks to tighten up. And historically, again, <laughs> um, Fed tightening coinciding with extremely um, richly valued assets is a recipe for um, a bear market, at least in a financial crisis, very possibly. So interesting times coming, Gary, as usual. Hey, well, look at housing. All right. Now, the housing market has rebounded. It's it's as high or higher than it was leading up to the crash, John, in many places. In some places, it's even more in, in your coastal regions, each coast, New York, Boston, Miami, not all of Florida, but Miami, uh, L.A., San Francisco, higher than ever. And this is on the face of really negative real interest rates, extremely low mortgage interest rates. Mortgage rates head back over 5%. I think you're going to start to have issues here, John. Not so much of a market collapse, but of prices coming down for the first time, of markets peaking. The other thing is that uh, the Fed is still buying 3 to $5 billion worth of mortgage-backed securities per week. And they say they're winding down their balance sheet. They're going to start getting rid of it. I got to see this happen because they own $1.7 trillion worth of mortgage-backed securities. Now, they're at the point where they don't have to print money to buy the new ones because they're probably making $5 billion a week or more in payoffs, mortgage payoffs, and in interest on those bonds because a lot of the bonds they bought, when they bought them, even though they bought them at par, it was a total ripoff on the taxpayer. They bought them at par, but the yields on them were like 5 to 8%. They've already filtered out all the defaults. Defaults are at, uh, at almost generational lows now, getting close to it, I should say. You know, hardly any foreclosures in mortgage foreclosures in Florida. They've just gone way, way down. All that inventory has been liquidated. The banks have dumped a lot of their shadow inventory, John. So we could see a major hit coming for real estate. Yeah, the, the thing to understand about residential, well, actually all real estate is it's a leveraged asset. So house prices, while, while they do fluctuate, they're not going to go to zero like a lot of stocks can, can go to. But if you've put down a 20% down payment and borrowed the other 80%, you know, a drop of 15 or 20 percent in the value of that asset is catastrophic for you as the owner. And, and that's what happens in downturns. A lot of people who borrowed a ton of money to buy something in a hot market find out that uh, based on their down payment, in other words, the amount of money that they originally um, put at risk to buy the thing, they're underwater. You know, they're losing money big time. And that exacerbates the problems because people decide that uh, maybe it's financially wise just to walk away. And so you get this kind of um, cascade drop in real estate prices for a year or two, um, historically. It could be much worse this time. Oh, yeah. It definitely We're be a lot so close to the end of the road financially in a lot of other ways. Uh, and, you know, you've got so many problems that could potentially happen, so many crises that could come at us from different directions. You know, there's a lot of geopolitics right now uh, where James Rickards, for instance, is saying that um, based on his connections in the security community, uh, that a, a war with North Korea is imminent. Now, you know, I, I don't know anything about that specifically, except that he's saying it, but something like that is completely conceivable based on all the rhetoric out there. But the markets aren't pricing something like that in. So let it happen or even be perceived as very possible instead of just, uh, you know, something that, that people are talking about but not acting on. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you, you've got every financial asset out there, including real estate, looking extremely pricey. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, it becomes wise for somebody who's got a lot of embedded profits to raise some cash, right? And and all that's all it takes with markets this richly valued uh, to, to go from euphoria to panic. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, we've created the conditions where something like that can happen very easily. Not to say that it's going to happen this week or even this coming year, but the conditions are ripe for something like that now. And, you know, I, Carrie, I, of course, have been saying that for three or four years now. <laughs> and, and conditions have been ripe, but mm. they keep getting more ripe as these numbers get bigger and bigger. So I, I think it's unrealistic to think that we can 
raise interest rates, shrink central bank balance sheets, uh, conduct foreign policy that's really contentious and that creates the risk of war in a lot of different places, and and still have financial asset prices at record high valuations. Something there's got to give. Even either the central banks have got to go back to QE on a vast scale, or we've got to um, to become a lot more cautious in foreign affairs, or prices have to come way down to account for those other things not happening. Uh, so I, I think the story of 2018 is going to be this stuff, these contradictions being reconciled somehow, some way. Somehow, some way. And hey, don't forget, John, we need to be optimistic. It's it's that special time of the year, Christmas, Hanukkah, depending on your persuasion, Kwanzaa, if you're into Kwanzaa. And we've got a really great offer for you from a new sponsor by the name of FragranceX.com. FragranceX.com. So look, they've got They've got like all the great brands and perfume, uh, Dolce Gabbana, Burberry, Calvin Klein, Hugo Boss, hundreds more. You've got discounted perfumes. They're 100 percent authentic and original guaranteed. Some of them have been discontinued. You get free shipping. If you don't like it, free returns. And using our code LUTZ20, that's L-U-T-Z 20, you will get an additional 20% off. It's great for the holidays. I can think of a few people I'm going to send it to. They've got millions of happy customers, John. So just go over to FragranceX.com, put in your email address, put in the LUTZ22 and shop away. You will be glad you did. Anyway, John, getting back to it, you know, this thing is long overdue. The so-called recovery, which has never really come, I mean, I defy you to show me the economic recovery. It looks like it's kind of peeking its head out now. Uh, you've got employment numbers. Even the cooked employment numbers, John, are looking pretty, pretty optimistic. Uh, you've got wages rising a bit. And uh, from that measure, inflation is even going up. But Let's let's take a look at the latest commitment of traders report that you follow rather religiously. What do you think it's telling us now, John? Well, the, the commitment of traders report is a, a measure of what's going on in the paper gold market. In other words, what futures traders are doing. And over the past few years, it's been a pretty good indicator of the you know six months out trend in gold and silver. Uh, and that's because um, there are speculators in the futures market who follow trends when gold. Gold and silver are going up. They get really excited and they go really long. Um, and this leads them to um, to have to close out those longs at some point. And as soon as gold and silver start to trend down a little bit, they panic and then they go really short. And they're wrong at the big turning points. You know, whenever they're... Um, euphoric or terrified, that's a sign that the opposite is going to happen. And uh, what, what happened in the last six months is that the speculators went really long. They got um, very excited about gold's prospects, um, made a lot of long bets in the futures market. Uh, but then instead of being forced out of the market and panicking and, and uh, going short again to set up a nice run in gold, they stayed long. You know, they, yeah. they went for several months with these really long positions while yeah. gold and silver drifted lower and lower and lower. Uh, but where the, um, the structure of the futures market wasn't positive. You know, it never mm -hmm. turned positive in all these months. But just in the last couple of weeks, the speculators have started to be flushed out. And the commercials, who usually prey on the speculators, ha have started to do the opposite. In other words, the speculators are selling their long positions and starting to go short. The commercials are selling their short positions and starting to go long. Now, that that is <laughs> usually the way this thing sets up for a nice rally in gold and silver. Uh, so January could be a really good month for precious metals if we get one more week, we, you know, when, when the next data comes out for commitment of traders, uh, which shows what happened last week. And if it's ex as extreme as what happened in the previous report, then it's safe to say that the, uh, the gold and silver markets are set up for a nice rally in January. So here's hoping. I think uh, you're right because, well, generally they've been rallying in December the past couple of years. Uh, and December was generally the weakest time for gold before that. And the past two years, they've been rallying. Maybe the December rally is going to come late. Uh, don't forget, we've got tremendous manipulation. No tinfoil hats here. But look, what better time to manipulate any market, regardless of its precious metals, stocks, bonds, it doesn't matter. Holiday trading is always technically weaker. And then 
the big boys come in and they slam a market up or down and it responds accordingly. So we could easily, easily see something like what you're describing within the next week or two. Um, you know, don't forget when they slam it, uh, they it comes back very quickly normally, uh, or it can come back very quickly, I should say. And I wouldn't be surprised to see it happen in the third to fourth week of this month, John, if it's going to happen. But I guess uh, Good. <laughs> <laughs> I left you speechless. It, it, you know, you've also got um, <laughs> yeah. you, you also got a, a lot of the tax loss selling in the mining stocks that's happening right now. Canadian and especially. Yeah. Yeah. And and so January coming after a down month for gold and silver, January is usually a pretty good month because people have gotten their tax loss selling out of the way. And so the selling pressure on mining stocks diminishes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there, there could be a lot of things going on that are positive for precious metals. You, know, you got the seasonality, you got the structure of the commitment of traders uh, report and um, and the diminishing of tax loss selling going into January. Yes. So, um, yeah, you know, this might be a good time to buy some mining stocks in anticipation of a pretty good few months in the first part of, uh, of 2018. You know, remember the first part of 2016, uh, that was a spectacular run for the mining stocks. You had a, little, a lot of little miners go up three, four, five times in, in just a few months. And now they've, they've drifted back down in the ensuing year and a half. But we, we could easily see something like that happen again if gold and silver pop. So, you know, it, it could finally be a fun time to be in gold and silver and to talk about it. <laughs> we'll see next yeah. week. Yeah, well, hey, I think 2018 is the year. Uh, I expected it to go up higher for the end of the year, but it kind of had that pop a couple months ago that was a little surprising. But I think it's going to come up, going to come back. But hey, don't listen to me. As I, my disclaimer is, if you listen to my advice, you will lose money, at least in the short term anyway. That's a guarantee. So don't go suing me because you said buy something because I never tell you to buy anything. But seriously, John, every dog has its day. This dog has been in the pound for six years already, John. You know, six and a half years. So it wouldn't be surprising to see it come back. It reminds me of in the... Uh, 90s, sugar was trading at two cents a pound. And the question was, were they going to grow sugar and then have to pay people to take it away because nobody wanted the stuff uh, because there was so much of it. And I think the artificial sweeteners, John, had really made an intense takeover of the sweetener market. Uh, they were selling more than ever before people really got health conscious because it's much healthier to eat sugar than to eat aspartame, let's face it, right? And what happened? Sugar went up to like 14 cents a pound, and 22 cents. So when something is un undervalued, it can stay undervalued a long time. Or maybe when it's overvalued and then the pendulum swings the other way, the pendulum will stay in that way for quite a while. But then eventually the values assert themselves, fundamentals assert themselves. And the key is to be in the right place at the right time when that happens. Agreed. So will it be a Christmas gift to the stackers and to the, uh, the gold bugs? My guess, if I had to rate it, I would call it, I would give it about a 62.5% chance that their day is coming, John. Okay, I will take that, Gary. All right, you could take it to the bookie. Yeah. <laughs> hey, but I've been wrong before, but now I feel like, you know, Markets are like tests of faith, tests of confidence. Forget about faith. And confidence in that market is so low now that it will probably go up as a result, John. Hey, well, that's it for this week. So make sure you check out John's site, dollarcollapse.com. Sign up for his newsletter. Sign up for ours at Financial Survival Network. Write us. Be part of the show. Uh, I just, um, I'm just reading some, uh, we had a couple of questions to read, John, but I forgot. But uh, John from Pittsburgh uh, says he's been visiting the site listens to many of our guests and their thoughts on topics of interest. Um, appreciate your efforts. And he wishes you and I a happy new year, John, and glad to see person who I will not name has departed. His rancor does not fit your format, in my opinion. Well, we can agree to disagree on that, John, but John, we wish you the best for the coming year. Uh, he goes by the, uh, acronym of Jarhead John, perhaps former U.S. Marine, I would say. Anyway, John, thanks, and we will uh, catch up with you next week, John. All right, Jarhead, listen to us. Keep listening, and 
even if you don't learn anything, at least you'll be pleasantly confused. Right, John? (laughs) That's all we can hope for sometimes, Gary. So take care. Talk to you next week. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.